Hello, hello, and welcome back to my channel. Today, I want to talk with you about some really interesting body piercing history. More specifically, I want to get into the history of the body piercing needle. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, the history of the needle, that can't be that interesting. But that's where you're wrong, completely, unequivocally dead wrong. See, when we talk about body piercing as an industry, especially here in America, it is a relatively young industry. Body piercing as a craft started in the 60s and 70s. This was before the first body piercing studio had ever opened in America. And back then, even just having access to any form of needle, let alone a needle that worked well for body piercing, was virtually unheard of. At this point in time, piercing was not widely accepted culturally, especially not here in America, which is what this video is going to center on. Piercing was primarily being practiced in gay, BDSM, and fetish spaces. It was underground, it was privatized, and it was definitely not something you wanted anyone to know about, from your neighbor to your coworker. Since piercing was being done by people who couldn't dream of going out and getting actual real supplies for their extracurricular activities, and again, this is the 60s or 70s, you couldn't go on Amazon and buy a cheap piercing kit to pierce yourselves with, you had to make do with what you had. People were literally taking wire and sharpening the end of it to use it for piercing. Likewise, people would take nuts and bolts, like literally the nuts and bolts you use when you build a piece of IKEA furniture, and filing down the ends to make them sharp enough to make it through the skin. There's even multiple well-documented reports of people using ice picks as piercing implements in that time. Everyone was just making do with whatever they had. You would take diamond dust polishing wheels and polish down the ends to try and get them as smooth and as sharp as you could, but make no mistake, these were not comfortable things to be pierced with. In the time period this was happening as well, you also have to remember that most of the piercings that people were getting done were nipple and genital piercings. So they were literally getting these piercings done with ice picks and sharpened pieces of wire in the 60s and 70s. And this is what people had access to, this was what there was around. Very quickly, people realized that this was obviously not working and obviously wasn't the best idea. And as piercing became more popular in certain subcultures, folks had to start getting creative. A lot of people who were interested in piercing or were performing piercings for people suddenly became very enthusiastic about horse ownership and had a lot of sick horses that they needed to go get needles for from the veterinary supply store. I got to sit down and talk with Jim Ward, creator of The Gauntlet and widely considered the father of the modern body piercing industry, about the needles that he used at the time. We bought a lot of supplies, including veterinary type needles from Arista Surgical Supply in New York. I would dutifully remove the syringe coupling. That continued up until the AIDS crisis when we felt it imperative that needles be disposable. We were reusing them, but they were always autoclaved twice between uses. Once so they could be handled, then they were cleaned and bagged and autoclaved a second time. They got very dull, but we kept using them. Then I sought out a manufacturer, I think it was B&D, who provided us with what they called cannulas. They served the purpose, single use, but to be honest, they weren't all that sharp. That's why we had to use needle pushers. It wasn't until about the time the gauntlet went under in the last 1990s that the companies began to manufacture needles specifically for piercing. You heard that right. In the early days of body piercing, they were reusing needles. This was before the AIDS crisis, and not much was known about the safety of reprocessing tools and supplies. In fact, this was a time period before most dentists use an autoclave. I have a client of mine who was a dentist in Washington, D.C. during the AIDS epidemic, and he was the first dentist in his area to purchase and use an autoclave to sterilize tools and instruments between clients. And he did it because he was a closeted gay man, and he wanted to be able to work on other gay men who no other dental practices would see because they were concerned about AIDS. But prior to that, we were reusing needles. And here's a graphic that shows how a needle gets dull after just a single use. So you can imagine what body piercing was like in the 70s and 80s when these needles were being used dozens, sometimes even hundreds of times. A quote, Jim Ward mentions using a needle driver, which was a tool that was really common in the 80s and 90s. And here's a picture of it. These are little hubs often made of acrylic or plastic that had various size holes drilled on each side. This way you could insert needles of different thicknesses in them and hold the driver in your hand and use the driver to provide back pressure to push the needle through the skin. The reason why needle drivers were necessary is because the needles were so dull that the amount of force required to get a piercing needle through the skin, oftentimes the back of the needle would cut into the piercer's palm. 
Likewise, it was not uncommon to see piercers using thimbles on their fingers to provide back pressure. That way they didn't stab themselves on the exit again because so much force was required to pierce with these needles that in comparison to today's needles were incredibly dull. And this was all they had at the time, and this was not that long ago. We're talking about the 70s, 80s, and even a little into the 90s. This is what people were using for body piercings. From there, the industry started becoming lucrative enough, and piercing and tattoo shops were popping up often enough that they were able to buy needles from medical manufacturers. So we started using hypodermic A and hypodermic B needles. But the issue with these needles is that they came with hubs on them, these little plastic caps that you see that allow needles to be attached to syringes, IV lines, for blood draws, any number of medical purposes. But for people who were doing body piercing who needed to pierce something and follow it through with jewelry, that hub got in the way of that transfer. So what did we do? Well, piercers unfortunately had to manually remove the hubs from every single needle. And if you remember, we're moving into the time period where needles started becoming single use. So that means every single needle you use for piercings in your studio, you had to manually remove the hub. Some studios sawed the hub off, but that left you with very short needles that could be hard to control. So in other studios, you ended up having to crunch the hub off with ring openers or pliers, whatever you had. And then because the hub was adhered with adhesive, you had to polish and file off and sand off the adhesive. That way you had a smooth needle that you could pierce with. Piercing apprentices at the time would spend thousands of hours removing hubs from needles, filing and polishing needles down and getting them prepared to be able to be pierced with. All of this work for, again, remember, needles that weren't really that sharp to begin with. Ken Dean from Silver Anchor says we would order them from a medical supply company by the hundreds. We would put them in a small lathe individually and remove the hubs and clean the outside and inside with a small rotary sanding tool while they were still in the lathe. Imagine in order to do a piercing, having to sit down, load every single needle into a lathe, cut off a hub, and then polish, file, and sand the interior of the needle to be able to use it. Or if you were in an area where you didn't have access to needles that would be long enough with the hubs removed, you had to sit there and break the hubs off with openers or pliers. Again, thousands of hours of work just to get one not very sharp needle to use for your piercings. And this was only about 30 years ago that this was common practice in the piercing industry. This was such common practice that in bigger cities, some people made a whole job out of just removing hubs and polishing needles. Folks who were looking to get into the industry but couldn't find an apprenticeship or didn't really jive well with a studio would work in studios' basements or back rooms, manually removing hubs, polishing and sanding down needles, packaging them, and then selling them to different studios for use. That way they didn't have to do it themselves. Obviously, none of this was a very easy or comfortable process, and it made getting prep work done for piercings significantly harder, especially as we start getting towards the 80s and 90s and piercings were growing in popularity. Studios went from doing a couple piercings a day to a dozen or two dozen. They were going through a lot more needles, making this process more important but more time consuming. Continued until a very fortunate interaction of fate happened at Body Manipulations in California in 1995. A woman named Maria Pinto, who had always been interested in body piercing, came in looking to get some work done. She happened to be a third generation needle manufacturer. Her grandfather had been making needles for the medical industry for many years at this point, and her family owned a needle manufacturing company. She grew up around the warehouse and knew the ins and outs of making needles. As she was hanging out in piercing studios and developing a love and an interest for body piercings, she overheard piercers complaining about this process of having to remove the hubs. She interjected and said, why not just buy them before the hubs are adhered? It's not like they're made with the hubs on. Obviously the hubs are being glued to the needles afterwards. Since her family owned a needle making company, she obviously knew what went into this. It had to be a light bulb moment for everyone involved. Let's just buy the needles before we get the hubs on it. But the next hurdle was finding a company who would sell needles like that. Remember, there's no precedent for looking for this type of needle. The needles we were using, hypodermic A's and B's, were only used in medical uses really with hubs on them at that time. So manufacturers were like, why would we ever sell them or take time in production to do them without? 
that's where that fate encounter with Maria came in. She took out a purchase order from her family's company for a couple hundred needles, individually bagged and sterilized them before the hubs ever went on, and started selling them to studios. She went around to different studios and talked with them, told them about different configurations of needles, like hypodermic A's and hypodermic B's, and all of the other needles that her family's company made. She tried selling lots of different needles to different studios and ultimately figured out that hypodermic A's and B's seemed to be what most people in the industry preferred and what most piercers gave her feedback got better results. However, hypodermic A's, which ended up being her most popular product, were designed for blood draws. They were designed to go in, get your blood, and then be backed back out. They weren't designed to go all the way through the tissue, and the bevel configuration on the needle allowed for this. When I talk about bevel, I mean the edges on a needle that are actually sharp and do the piercing. When we're talking about piercing needles, and also hypodermic needles, we're talking about tri-bevel needles. So they have three bevels that do the work. A point bevel at the tip of the needle, a secondary bevel that curves up, and then a third bevel or the heel of the bevel in the back. Now the three bevel needles that Maria was selling was designed for blood draws, not for piercing. So what people were noticing is that it was causing a lot of extra trauma. These needles were leaving flaps of unsightly tissue on the exits. They were making it hard in certain areas to pierce and piercers just weren't getting phenomenal results. This was all still better than again, sharpening wire and using ice picks. But Maria looked at what was going on, looked at the feedback from customers and said, there's definitely a better way. We've got to design a needle that's meant to go all the way through the skin. And that's exactly what she did. We took an A bevel and we modified it. It has a longer bevel, which is supposed to be less painful really is what it was designed for. We basically looked at the fact that you needed the bevel to exit and the A bevels were designed to go into the vein and retract with the least amount of trauma. What we were finding was when we kept the bevel at the standard length, it wasn't giving us a clean exit. So we came up with these proprietary configurations which changed the geometry of an A bevel and made it the geometry for us, which we call our body piercing needle. So that when you go through the skin and exit, you weren't tearing out the back, you were still maintaining that nice oval cut the entire way through. There's a lot of other factors to that as well. It's not just the geometry. It's certain ways to manufacture the equipment, to hold tolerances, to keep your primary and secondary angles at such a slight degree of difference that you feel very little exit, if any at all, for your clients. This was happening alongside a couple other really exciting developments in the body piercing industry. Brian Skelly was working with a company called Vita to design different body piercing needles. And of course, there were still studios where people were manually removing hubs and selling those needles to piercers. Maria, however, was determined. She saw the potential for this to become a business, and she really dedicated her time and the resources she had, being a third generation needle maker, to doing research and development and really designing and refining her own piercing needle. Eventually, she launched the first flyer for IS. Eventually, she launched the first flyer for Industrial Strength LLC body piercing needles. She shipped it out to a couple different studios around the country, and before she knew it, she was in business. With the work that she did to educate the piercing industry about the importance of the tri-bevel needle and the proprietary proportions that she had designed, all of a sudden, piercers around the country were asking, oh, do you have a tri-bevel needle of the folks that they were purchasing from? Thanks to all of this education, piercers around the industry in the 90s knew that they wanted a tri-bevel needle, but there was much more that went into it than that, and Maria used all of the experience and knowledge she had from being a third generation needle maker to educate the industry. She taught piercers that not only was a tri-bevel needle important, but the proportions and configurations of the bevel were essential in order to do a clean, safe piercing. This is where bevel theory becomes introduced to the piercing industry and we start seeing a greater understanding of how the needles we use affect the angles and outcomes of our piercings. She also took the time to educate piercers about why the quality of the company you purchase from and the quality of the needles you purchased was really important. Prior to this time, passivation sheets for needle manufacturers weren't really a thing in the body piercing industry, at least not until Maria started sharing some education and making piercers realize how important this is. Passivation is a process that needles go through to make them resistant to rust and other issues during storage. This means you can purchase 100 needles at a time, keep them in storage, and as long as they're stored properly, they'll still be good to use when you're ready to pierce with them. 
Not only that, but making sure that your needles were made out of a higher quality of steel that would hold a better edge, educating piercers about the production that goes into the creation of needles. Korea, coming with a background from medical needles, passivation sheets and these things were already required, so it was a no-brainer to have them for piercing needles as well. This started a chain reaction of piercers starting to look more at their supplies and their jewelry, starting to look more into mill certificates, into the tools we worked with, and starting to take care every step of the piercing process to make sure we're providing as safe, cautious, and clean an experience as possible for clients. From there, years of research and development went into really perfecting that proprietary needle configuration. Literally hundreds of thousands of tests similar to what they do when they're testing for medical needles to figure out the perfect configuration of piercing needle. A lot of love, research, care, and thoughtfulness went into making this design. And very quickly, companies selling needles that were cut off from hubs dropped off and companies selling cannula needles dropped off as piercers realized not only were there better, cleaner, safer needles available, they did the job better, they were more comfortable for clients, and they were actually relatively accessible. From there, the focus on improving the needle just took off. We started looking into coatings like Teflon and silicon coatings. These already had different uses in the medical industry, and as piercers were researching more and looking more into different needles, they started asking about the ways these coatings could be applied to our industry. IS LLC was once again at the forefront, coming out with their Teflon-coated sharp-ass needle, which had a body-safe Teflon coating over the entire needle that really reduced drift and made the needle just glide through the skin. Eventually, silicone coatings became introduced to the industry with the katana needle produced by Anatometal. Katanas were widely considered the industry's favorite, and I remember growing up in the industry seeing pictures of those little needle tubes with those little red caps and going, ah, I can't wait till I get to use one of those. Eventually, katana needles were discontinued, and they eventually morphed into what became Kiwami, also offered from Anatometal. With thicker walls and a silicone coating, Kiwami needles are hands down some of my personal favorite needles for a lot of usage, and they're so smooth, they're so buttery, and they genuinely make a huge difference to the sensation of process of getting pierced. These days, there's no shortage of really phenomenal companies to purchase needles from that all offer different, unique, high-quality needles that work for different purposes within our industry. I'm so picky, I have a favorite needle companies for different types of piercings that I'm doing, but IS LLC and Kiwami will always hold a place in my heart. Kiwami for the phenomenal manufacturing of their needles and their silicone coating, and IS LLC for tirelessly working to support the industry, the broad range of needles that they produce probably more so than any other manufacturer when we're talking about really getting into unique sizes and unique needs, and also the fact that they're the whole reason that we have the needles we have today. I think something that's really easy to get lost in is truly just how young the piercing industry is. Again, 30 or 40 years ago, we didn't even have needles to pierce with. We had ice picks and sharpened pieces of wire. There are piercers today who now can order some of the best needles in the world from companies who 20 years ago were spending hours in a dark basement sawing hubs off of hypodermic needles to do piercings with. There are piercers alive today who remember a time before single-use needles, when they were re-sterilizing needles dozens, potentially, of times between customers. We are so fortunate in the piercing industry as it stands in 2023 to have access to the tools and supplies that we do, and for this industry to have seen so much growth over these years. I cannot express how much fun I had researching and digging deep into the topic of the history of the piercing needle and looking at how far the industry has come in such a short period of time. This type of research and work and my ability to bring this information to you is entirely thanks to Sacred Debris who sponsored this video. Sacred Debris is an archive that's documenting and preserving piercing history from preserving videos, radio interviews, and photographs to interviewing piercers about their time in the industry. Sacred Debris is working very hard to make sure that we don't lose these important elements and pieces of our history to time and that everything gets documented as well. You can read all about the history of the piercing needle far more in depth than this video goes into in the Nodal Point zine that I originally wrote this piece for. And right now, Sacred Debris is doing their biggest sale of the year where you can get a number of really amazing books, photo books, and zines, all of which cover topics related to body piercing and body modification history at an amazing price point. All that's spent on Sacred Debris goes right back into archive. 
whether it's to purchasing lots of photos and magazines so they don't get destroyed, the time that it takes us to archive and document these things, or the wild and outdated equipment we often need to buy in order to be able to download old tapes and old media, all of your support goes to making sure we keep these elements of piercing history alive. This is something I'm so incredibly passionate about and nothing would mean more to me than you choosing to take some time and a little bit of money to support Sacred Debris in our annual sales so that we can continue preserving this history that is so important to this industry. If you're a piercer or an apprentice or just a big enthusiast, everything Sacred Debris puts out is genuinely phenomenal for learning about the history. And if you aren't, I bet your piercer would absolutely be over the moon with one of the zines or even just one of the pins as a tip. I'm going to link all of that information in the caption down below, but thanks so much for taking this trip with me through the history of the piercing needle. This is one of the most fascinating deep dives I've gotten to do, and I cannot wait to sit down and work with Sacred Debris to look at other cool piercing history topics like this and really delve into how the industry became what it is today. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. Bye!